Well, hi, everybody, and thanks for joining us. Welcome to Ask the Experts, an interactive Facebook Live event. Uh, tonight, we're talking about COVID-19 vaccination and, and how things might look for the next few weeks and months. Everything from first and second doses to a mixing and matching, uh, masks, vaccines for teens, summer activities, and really a whole lot more. I'm Sean McMahon, host of the Your Health Podcast, which you can uh, subscribe to and stream anytime over on our website at cuswestcentral.ca slash podcast and on all your favorite podcast platforms, Google, Apple, iHeart, Spotify, SoundCloud. It is everywhere. If you haven't uh, subscribed yet, uh, what are you waiting for? You can do that today. Always lots of great stuff. My guest tonight, absolutely love uh, chatting with this guy, uh, attending physician in the uh, Division of Infectious Diseases and Medical Microbiologist at the Jewish General Hospital. Dr. Matthew Outen is with us. Dr. Matt, how are you? I am top shape, Sean. Thank you very much for having me on. I really appreciate this. It's uh, it's our pleasure on a night when the Habs are playing. We appreciate you taking the time because I know you're a big hockey fan. So. <laughs> oh, what's this? I've got my oh, look at this. all set. You're all set to go. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, uh, if you're watching this on demand, good things have already happened. Uh, you've been at the heart of the pandemic since uh, the very beginning. So uh, we really do appreciate you joining us. I do want to remind everybody that if you're looking for any COVID-19 uh, vaccination info, you can go to cuswestcentral.ca slash COVID-19. And uh, you'll also find there all the information about how to advance your second dose appointments uh, as per the government's schedule and guidelines, because there are guidelines. And uh, to always stay up to date, you can follow us on our social media platforms, like right here on Facebook, on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. The community grows every single day, and we love interacting with you guys. Just search for Cius Centre West, that's C-I-U-S-S-S. -S -S. All right, lots of questions to get to. So let's, uh, let's dive right in, okay, Dr. Outen. Um, and, and thanks uh, to all of you for sending in so many of them in advance. We will try to grab uh, as many of those as we can, and from the comments on our Facebook uh, Live as well. Um, let's start with vaccine efficacy, if we could. Uh, many months of data now finally uh, behind us, and you know more and more people are getting vaccinated. First off, roughly what percentage of the population has been vaccinated so far? So this is really a story under evolution. And if you look at the denominator as the entire Canadian population, then right now we're somewhere around 65% of the population has had at least one dose. But keep in mind that denominator even includes young kids who haven't uh, been allowed to have a dose yet because that data is still not out. That's, that approval is still not there. So that's about 65% of the entire Canadian population and about 7.5% of the entire Canadian population has now had uh, both doses. And the Quebec data looks very similar to that. On the other hand, to uh, look at it slightly differently, if you take as the denominator all of the people who could conceivably get vaccinated, just in the last day or so, we've hit a fairly important milestone that overall across Canada, we're around 75% of the entire population, which is we're not all the way there because that's only one dose and one dose is very different than uh, two doses, but it's looking very good for us, as long as we continue this pace that uh, throughout the summer, we're going to be in a really, really good uh, place by the end of the summer. That's great. It's nice to hear, you know, after everything that everybody's lived through to get some encouraging news is, uh, is really terrific. Um, what do we know about the efficacy of, of Pfizer and Moderna and AstraZeneca that maybe we didn't know a few months ago? And I guess the question is, is are they working the way that we hoped? I would say that they're working very well. All of those vaccines that have been approved for use in Canada are very effective and generally very safe. And they're particularly effective at preventing the worst disease, the severe disease, the disease that's landing people in hospital or in the intensive care unit. And from that level, all of those vaccines are, are working very well. In a strange way here in Quebec, the dominant variant that we've now had for many, many weeks has been what we were calling the UK variant or B117, now what we're calling the alpha variant. That's important because all of the vaccines that have been commonly used, Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, are like always have been and continue to be very, very effective against that variant. So we're doing very, very well because at the present time, still most of the circulating disease is in people who haven't been vaccinated or only just got their first dose and didn't actually have enough time to mount an immune response. But we don't have a lot of the, some of the other variants that look like you really need both doses to uh, achieve immunity, such as what used to be called the, one of the Indian variants, B1617.2, or now we're calling the, the Delta variant. Thankfully, we haven't seen a lot of that here in Quebec and only in very small pockets across Canada. 
That's interesting. Uh, a lot of questions that have come in. Uh, with this one coming in from Joanne on uh, Facebook. Uh, do you foresee a third dose as a booster? That's an excellent question. That has been postulated by some vaccine researchers. That has also been postulated by the vaccine manufacturers. Uh, however, I would say at the present time, what it's looking like is that uh, certainly two doses of either of the popular mRNA vaccines and Within the next month, we're going to know about the mixing and matching, specifically uh, uh, a, the first dose, the prime dose of AstraZeneca, followed by the second dose or boost of one of the mRNA vaccines. That combination uh, we'll know for sure when, this, uh, when a few studies report in the next few weeks, but it looks like that combination will also be very highly effective, give very long-lasting immunity, and what I would call very broad immunity that's effective against uh, most, if not all, of the circulating variants. So if those trends continue, if, those, if that kind of immunity really is high-level, long-lasting, and sustained across a broad range of variants, we may not need uh, a third booster. It's still early to tell. We've seen variants already catch us by surprise, sometimes with their transmissibility or their ability to escape the immunity generated by remote infection or by only partial vaccination. So I'd say that anything is still on the table, but at the present time, 100% getting both doses is important. Don't stop after just one. And uh, if you get both doses, I think you'll be positioned very well, both for yourself and those around you, your family at home, your uh, coworkers uh, at work, you'll be protected against both exposed uh, exposure from them and exposing them because these vaccines not only protect yourself, they protect those around you because they clearly also reduce transmission, which is absolutely huge for getting this pandemic under control. You mentioned uh, the, the buzz term, uh, mix and match, uh, briefly there. I just want to come back to that, maybe unpack it a little bit, uh, because that's one of the questions that we've received. You know, is it okay to mix and match different types of the vaccine? So in other words, I got AstraZeneca for my first vaccine. Can I get Moderna or Pfizer for my second one? Is that safe? Is it recommended? Is it safe? So at the present instant here in Canada, NACI has said that if you got your first dose of AstraZeneca, then for your second dose, you basically have the choice yourself of getting the second dose of AstraZeneca or getting a second dose of one of the mRNA vaccines. By contrast, if you got your first dose of one of the mRNA vaccines, then generally you should get the, that same vaccine as the second dose, or in the case of a shortage, for example, this week, as it turns out, we're getting only Pfizer uh, and AstraZeneca. We're not getting any uh, uh, doses of Moderna shipped to Canada this week, although we're getting a lot of them uh, arriving a week from now. But we have, we've had these sort of on and off intermittent shortages. So in the case of a shortage, when you go to get your second dose, if you have to switch mRNA from Pfizer to Moderna or vice versa, that uh, also has Nasty's blessing. The big question though is, uh, when it comes to mixing and matching, is there any harm and is there any benefit? So right now, there's absolutely nothing to suggest that there's any major long-lasting harm. Okay. There's been two studies that have partially reported. Now, I say partially because one study, it's uh, called the ComCov and ComCov2 trial coming to the United Kingdom. They've reported their data on what they call reactogenicity, the side effects that have been generated. Generally speaking, the short-term, you know, uh, injection site tenderness, uh, fatigue, headache, maybe fever the last one or two days. And their study found that when you mix and match, you actually get a higher level of these local, oh, limited, not serious effects. By contrast, a Spanish group doing a very similar trial called Combivax, they looked at exactly the same question and came to a different answer in their study participants that they didn't see a higher rate of mixing and matching compared to just sticking with the same thing. So we have a bit, uh, this is not the first time this has happened in science. I think uh, we're going to see more studies coming out and we'll get a clearer picture. I would say that the higher rate, if that is a real thing, of, uh, si of local side effects, it's not a serious thing, and it might even be a hint of what we've also been seeing both in animal data and again in limited um, uh, human data, especially preprint sort of uh, data that hasn't yet been fully vetted and uh, reviewed. But we're seeing lots of evidence that you actually get a boost in terms of a stronger immune response, higher titers of neutralizing antibodies, 
higher amounts of the uh, uh, T cells that recognize the spike protein, which are all important, both when it comes to protecting you, as well as generating that uh, immunologic memory. So there's a lot of hints that you might actually get a boost and have stronger responses, but the really definitive data is supposed to be reported sometime later on this month. So really look forward to that. That's very interesting. Uh, I want to say hi to Anna with a question on our Facebook stream. Uh, and actually, we've had this question in various forms, but it's all basically the same question. She wants to know if we've uh, been COVID positive in the past, should we get a second dose of the vaccine? Oh, that's an awesome question. So from the point of view of immunology, there's a lot of data to show that people who had COVID recovered and then got one dose, at least the data that I know of, shows that one dose of either of the mRNA vaccines Pfizer or Moderna, uh, that you seem to mount really good immunity. And one, just I'll do a slight deep dive, one trial that was really interesting looked at uh, neutralizing antibodies against different variants. Okay, And what they found was that people who had recovered but not been vaccinated, they had neutralizing antibodies against whatever it was that they had been infected with and recovered from, but not so much against some of the different variants out there. But the moment you got one dose of the mRNA vaccines, all of a sudden, you had a much broader repertoire of uh, antibodies that actually then could re uh, recognize and bind to and uh, neutralize the variants, even though you never actually had come across it. That's sort of the, the advantage of the, of the vaccination. Mm -hmm. The one thing I will caution you about, and I've been surprised that we haven't seen more of this discussed at governmental levels, is that although immunologically it makes sense that probably one dose will be sufficient to protect you and give you long lasting and broad immunity, when it comes to being classified as fully vaccinated, either here in Quebec or across Canada or even in other countries, I haven't seen people like that recognized. It's always about once you have two vaccinations, here's your QR code, here's your certificate if you need to do international travel. I would imagine that at some point there will be an assay, probably a blood test or a combination of antibodies plus T cell uh, specific to spike protein. Then we do that blood test and if you're positive, then that will be the surrogate proof that you are effectively immune. But until we have that kind of tool, you can see the problem here is that you might be immune, but you don't have the proof of that immunity. So for example, if your travel to another province or another country requires that proof, you got to get that second dose. And it's not harmful to you if you do, because that's one of the questions that we had. Somebody's son had COVID in January, got the vaccine in April, told, you know, you don't need to get the second vaccine. But then another healthcare professional uh, tells this, this person, uh, but if you want to show proof of a second vaccine for something like travel, as you're saying, mm -hmm. uh, you would need that second vaccine. So is it harmful to his health or would it's, the side effects be any worse was the question. It's, it's there. not going to be harmful in terms of a higher risk of major side effects, but I would imagine it's very likely that you would have a higher chance of local side effects. Again, the tenderness, the soreness, maybe headache, fatigue, uh, you know, sort of a fever or malaise for a day or so, but those still should be temporary. If you're feeling really bad, you can always take some acetaminophen or ibuprofen to uh, get over the worst of it. And those will not be long lasting. So it's a, it's an inconvenience, but it's nothing more than that. Uh, time is running away from us really, really quickly. So let's get to a few more things. And I want to talk about kids and teens because teenagers across the city you know, as you know, are in the process of getting vaccinated, now available 12 plus with the Pfizer vaccine. Is it safe for teens to get the COVID vaccine? And I want to take that just a little bit further. What would sure. you say to a parent who's maybe watching right now, maybe feels comfortable getting vaccinated themselves, but they're unsure about their teenager getting it? Are there any differences that really need to be considered between adults and teens when it comes to COVID vaccination? So it's, uh, it's been established to be both effective and safe for teenagers. Right now, we uh, have the ability to give uh, Pfizer to uh, uh, children ages 12 and above. And uh, that approval uh, has just been submitted for Moderna. And I expect that that approval will also be uh, granted sometime in the next few weeks to come. And then over the course of the summer, maybe towards the end of the summer, we're going to see similar studies looking for younger children. One of the differences being that teenagers immunologically are a lot like adults. You can give them the same dose. You can essentially measure uh, the same kinds of uh, immunologic mediators to make those kinds of determinations. Whereas with younger children, you have to actually come up with different uh, dosages, usually obviously lower doses. So that becomes a little bit more complicated. But 
Uh, is it safe? Yes. Uh, the FDA, when they were reviewing this data, held a vote, as they have to, to say uh, for their table of experts around the, uh, uh, around the table, is it safe? 14 to 0 that yes they would uh, declare this to be safe for uh, for uh, children uh, is covid-19 a threat to children it is now it's not clearly for children they don't get as sick as adults but they still can get sick uh, uh, good data fairly recently from the american academy of uh, pediatricians showed that children have about a 0.8% chance of being hospitalized uh, from COVID-19. That sounds lo low, right? That, that's less than 1%, but that still actually puts it anywhere from two to five times higher than the risk of them being hospitalized for influenza. Okay. Wow. And that's, I'm not talking about over this last year where there was no influenza. I'm talking about during a year where there was bad influenza, even 2009 with the pandemic influenza, then COVID-19 wins hands down. So do what you can to protect your kids, educate them, get them that first dose when they're eligible to get them their second dose. I think that's going to position them really well to have a much more stable school experience uh, come the start of the uh, school year, uh, you know, September, 2021. And before moving on, I mean, a lot of similar questions coming in on Facebook from Allison, a similar one from Paula, uh, sorry, not from, from Nancy, rather about the kids under 12. And you've, you've touched on that just now, but and not to simplify it, but really it just sounds like it is a wait and see approach for the under 12 crowd at the moment. Yes. I mean, the data we've seen from every other age bracket right now makes me expect that we're going to see similar efficacy and safety data, uh, safety data in that younger uh, group. The thing is, by the time that th those trials are done and evaluated and reported, there certainly won't be enough time to get a two-dose series done before the start of the school year. But depending when they report, there may be at least time to start and get that first uh, uh, vaccination. And both for the protection of the children, don't forget that there's, there can be some very serious complications. There's a, a syndrome called MIS-C, a multisystemic inflammatory syndrome, kind of like Kawasaki's disease that happens in kids. And although it's relatively rare, it's devastating, can lead to very high rate of need for hospitalization, uh, disturbing a high rate of uh, severe illness and death from this. And you need to get this vaccine in order to be protected against that. And I think to me, it's a, uh, it's, not even a question. I want to see the data before uh, that gets officially approved, but I would be very surprised if there's anything less than full both safety and efficacy data for that uh, age group as well. Let me uh, give you a few rapid fire questions before we close out. Life after the vaccine, right? I mean, we're all just looking forward to getting our lives back, some normalcy, seeing family and friends and enjoying summer because we love summer in Montreal. There's nothing like it as much as possible. Uh, questions about life over the next few weeks and months. Uh, number one, quickly, do I still need to wear a mask after being fully vaccinated? You get two doses. Is that still going to be a thing? So let's travel back in time about 15 minutes when I said about the, across Canada, seven and a half percent or so of the population is doubly vaccinated. That means 92 and a half percent have not yet been doubly vaccinated. So I would still recommend that for the protection of others, right, you have to assume that most of the people out there have not been vaccinated. So at the moment, yes, I would still be masking uh, to uh, at least protect those who haven't uh, had the opportunity of being fully vaccinated yet. And that will probably change as we get more and more of the population vaccinated, you know, sort of similar to what we've seen uh, happen in the United States, but we're not there yet. When can we start hugging our parents and our grandparents again? Uh, this is one Boy, that I've asked myself. It's, it's, yeah, it's been tough. Yeah, it certainly has. And uh, I've already warned my parents that I've been working out a little bit, so I don't want to, you know, hug them too hard. Um, don't break a rib. That's you know? right. So uh, <laughs> what, I've, uh, what, what I'd recommend is at the present time, uh, you know, follow your local public health guidance. You're still not supposed to have large uh, gatherings at a private uh, facility like your home uh, outside. You know, those uh, recommendations are currently under evolution as we go through, you know, we've just shifted from red to orange zone here in Montreal. We're going to be shifting down over the next uh, several weeks. But at the present time, I would say that the minimum criteria for a safe, close hug would be you and the parent or grandparent both the huggy to, i think that's the technical and the hugger term. and the huggy that's right <laughs> have to be uh doubly vaccinated and at least two to three weeks after that second dose i would also still recommend that you uh wash your hands uh, very well uh, before okay so that's 
you know, I think we're, most of us are not in that position where those criteria are met yet. I think we will be later on in the summer. And yeah, better look out because there's going to be a hugging epidemic. Listen, I'm about to hug you because you're giving me some hope right here. Well, you just wait. Uh, uh, last couple of quick ones, really, really quickly. Things like summer festivals and concerts and sporting events. If we see, you know, uh, 2,500 people at the Bell Center for a hockey game, like we're getting there, right? That's the, the nice thing. What needs to happen before it's safe again like it was before? Is it all just about the numbers? Uh, it really is about the numbers. I mean, there's lots of, of data right now and lots of different measurements to show that here in Quebec, at least, things continue to go well. If you look at even the pessimistic projections over uh, the rest of this month, we're still on a downward slope of the number of new cases per day. Our RT value is way below one, which means that for every new case, we're generating much less than one new case. So again, the numbers are diving. The percent positivity is like 1.1%. We haven't been there since like August or September of uh, last year. So, and things are things look are looking like they're only going to get better. So the less and less disease there is in the community, the safer these events will come. What we've already seen happen in other countries, for example, Israel, was for a while, what they were doing was having these kinds of uh, uh, music concerts, but you had to provide proof of vaccination before right. you would be able to uh, to enter. And I suspect that is sort of a transition period until such time as the numbers of cases in the community come down even further. But I wouldn't be surprised if we see something like that for a time at least, because like I said, we're still seven and a half percent vaccinated, uh, doubly vaccinated. We've got a, we've got a ways to go yet. Uh, just a, a tip of the cap to every local restaurant owner and all the festival organizers it's been a really tough go for everybody trying to make a living on those types of things uh and we're thinking about all of you too because this has made it quite difficult obviously for the livelihood of a lot of people last one a lot of people have been working from home for a very long time not everybody's um excited to go back <laughs> to the office uh, it's going to be a big adjustment and, and with new habits to get accustomed to what does the office look like in like september 2021 according to dr matthew out yeah it's going to be different than pre-pandemic. I think we're going to have sort of two groups of workers. We're going to have the commuters and the computers. We're going to have the people who are going back to office and doing it in person. And obviously there's some jobs where that's really important and uh, makes the job a lot easier. We're going to have other people who will probably continue to do this, uh, you know, teleworking, telecommuting, call it what you will. And I think it's obviously going to take some adaptation. Look, we've done the same thing in medicine, right? A few years ago, I would never have uh, evaluated patients by telephone or by a Zoom call, but now that's become an accepted way of things, especially at times where there was a lot of disease in the community. And I have so many patients who are old and limited mobility, and they honestly, I felt bad in the old days, having to bring them in where they have to park in the middle of January, walk right. three blocks, risk falling on a slippery sidewalk and everything else. And now they can do it from the comfort of their home. So we're going to have some hybrid model, I think, and this is going to apply not just to healthcare, but I think to all sorts of different uh, businesses. But I, I, I'm really looking forward to having some of the old ways back I mean, day like today, 32 degrees, this is terrace weather. This is the weather you want to be out there cheering on the Habs with a nice cold glass of your favorite beverage on a patio somewhere. And I really want us to get there and stay there. Uh, well, I will let you uh, get to your uh, your favorite uh, beverage uh, and uh, and maybe watch whatever's left of the uh, of the Canadians game. Uh, if you're watching this uh, live, we appreciate you being there on Facebook. If you're watching this on demand, uh, we appreciate that too. And, and feel free to share, of course. Uh, that is, uh, we kept you longer than we anticipated, uh, but we really appreciate the time that you've given us tonight. It's all the time we have for this Facebook Live event. Uh, thanks again to Dr. Matthew Outen, attending physician in the Division of Infectious Diseases and medical microbiologist at the JGH, and to all of you for tuning in uh, uh, and being part of this discussion. Uh, Dr. Outen, much appreciated. Thanks for this, and, and thanks for everything you've been doing, uh, everybody at, um, at the CUS, uh, in so many different ways. Uh, just rowing in the same direction trying to get us out of this so <laughs> we appreciate the time thanks again all right thank you very much sean have a good one you too and on that note a reminder uh, that walk-in vaccination continues at sites across our territory for uh, pfizer bill Dernan arena this week has extended hours as of june 10th also available at the carry square we're talking first doses and uh just added walk-in appointments available tomorrow and wednesday at the mill campus of Université de montreal in outremont lots of different options and places to get vaccinated to go roll up your arm and, and help, really help put an end to this thing. Uh, for details and any info on vaccination, you can go to our, our website, cuswestcentral.ca slash COVID-19 or right here on our Facebook page. Dr. Matthew Outen, have a great evening. Thanks all. Stay safe and we'll talk to you real soon. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Sean.
Stay well. Uh, okay. <laughs>